I like meeting with you guys. It is a joy to see you on Sunday mornings, to know online people that you're here with us. Um, I do often feel some pressure. It's a, it's a thing God's prepared me for. Like, he's made me to be okay with it. But to share with you the goodness of God, because I love him. And um, I want to convey that. And not, I don't want to convey my love. I want to convey who he is in a way that causes you to deeply love him. So let's pray. Lord, would you do that? Would you, like roots that go down deep, would, would you make a way that our roots would go down deep into you, Jesus? into who you are, into your character, into what you're like. Not so that we just like have an activity on Sunday mornings where we come and join some people and some, sing some songs and listen to somebody talk and then um, leave. But God, in a way that like impacts every aspect of our lives, I pray that you would do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um. We're in this series uh, on Luke 15. We're actually going to look at a little bit more of that passage, uh, not just the passage we've been in, but the two stories that happened right before it. It's a story of lost things. What, what Disney movie, I know I asked about this a few weeks back, what Disney movie has lost things in it? It's like Tinkerbell? Is that right? Is it lost things that she finds? And she's like, I don't know what these things are for. But I feel like um, The Little Mermaid has a little of that going on too, right? Okay. So there are lost things that Jesus talks about in the Bible. He is telling, it's like story time with Jesus, okay, but cool for adults. I mean, not the kids, you get me. Okay. So Jesus is telling a couple stories, and I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Because this is a really cool passage, a, a chapter of the Bible, and three stories about lost things. Now, have you lost something lately? Think about something that you've lost. Now, I hope you found it. And actually, next week, we're going to talk about lost and found. Okay, but so think about the stories you've had, maybe where you've lost something. But have you lost something, and then you're like turning everything over in your house, especially if you're running late? Anybody? Just me. Okay, no. We're, we're like, we're running late. We don't know where that thing is. We can't leave the house unless we have it. Or maybe we have plenty of time to look for it, but it's something so precious to us, and we're stressed out because we cannot find it. Jesus tells three stories about lost things in Luke 15. The first one is the parable or story. It's a story that packs a punch. Think about one of the coolest movies you've seen lately. It's a story that delivers a message. And um, as I've mentioned in the last couple of weeks, it causes you to think about it for days afterwards, right? A really good movie that engages your thoughts. Um, that's what a parable is intended to do, and Jesus tells it. So he tells this story of the lost sheep. Who is he talking to? Tax collectors, it says in verse 1, and sinners, people who were designated as sinners, people who couldn't even go into the temple because of what they did professionally or maybe their sort of status in the community. It's a sad story, but it's true. There were people who weren't allowed in the temple, and Jesus is talking to both the leaders of uh, religious leaders of his day and these people. That, it's this really cool dichotomy, group of people. Jesus does that, by the way. There's not a group he doesn't want to connect with, okay? But he's talking to tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees and scribes. And the Pharisees and scribes are grumbling, you know? They're saying, they're saying this man receives sinners and even eats with them. Eating was a big deal there. Like, if you eat with somebody, that's... That's, that's sharing in relationship. So they're gathered, and Jesus tells them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he fi has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, Jesus says, I tell you, there will be more joy 
in heaven over one sinner who repents, who turns back to God, all right, than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, who doesn't need repentance? These people have designated themselves as righteous. The religious leaders, by and large, in that day, were earning their way, working so hard to be good enough to be right with God, to be righteous. But Jesus says, I tell you, there, there will be more joy in heaven over one person who truly turns back, like we talked about last week, waking up to our sin like an alarm clock, right? Being attentive to God's goodness, like waking up to his goodness, and then going to Jesus for what we need. If you don't remember, um, I needed to re remind myself of that this week. That was what we were talking about last week. That's what repentance means, running back into relationship with him or into relationship for the first time. So that's pretty cool. There's a heavenly celebration that happens, even over one person who returns to God. I love that about God. He is a party planner, a party thrower. He loves it. We were designed to celebrate. We were designed to celebrate. If people view Christians as only somber and serious, we are misrepresenting God. He loves it that we celebrate. Look at creation. Thank you, Christine, for sharing those beautiful pictures of Ireland. Creation itself celebrates God. If you have some flowers that are growing, we've got hydrangeas that are about to bloom at our house. I mean, they are celebrating God. They declare the goodness and the glory of God in and of themselves. Even the lightning, the power of the wind, we experienced some storm last night, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it shows God's power. Okay, and, um, and so we, just like all of creation, are designed to celebrate God. Okay, let's keep going. The next parable, the next story, it's a story of the lost coin. Okay, Jesus says, or how about this story, guys? What woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently? By the way, these coins weren't just ordinary coins. Okay, and we're not gonna be able to dig into this passage um, real deeply right now, but it's precious to her, okay? Who, she doesn't, she lights every light in the house, right? See as well as she can, sweeps the house and seeks diligently until she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls together her friends, you get this, this, this idea, and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so Jesus says, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then the story that we've been working through of the two sons. The two sons, the younger one of them, who says, hey, dad, you know, I'm ready. I am ready to go into the world. I'm going to a foreign land. I'm getting as far away from you as possible. Can I have my inheritance now, please? Which in that culture was super insulting to the dad. I mean, it's basically saying, I'd rather you be dead, dad. In fact, can we just hurry this up a little bit so I can have my inheritance now? And how insulting, how heartbreaking, especially in that culture that honor is like a really big deal. We, we kind of lose that here in our American culture. Like, it's not like we don't appreciate honor, but in Jesus' day and in Jewish culture, honor was really important, respect really important. What a disrespectful thing for this young son to do. But the father, he, he uh, I don't know if it gives in, he gives the freedom of the son to ask that and he releases the son to do what the son wants to do. By the way, if I haven't made this clear enough, Jesus is telling this story about the father and two sons and he's talking about how God is the father. He's wanting to paint a picture to them of who God the Father is, what he's like. And so if we want freedom, if we want to say, you know what, God, I'm out. Or, I, I want nothing to do with you. That's the freedom, the song was singing about, that's the freedom that we live in. We have that ability, okay? Now, some people do that in really dramatic ways. And um, I will say my, my story is probably a little different than that. Not that there haven't been significant moments in my life where I have, definitely said, yeah, God, I don't want you in this aspect of my life. 
But um, there are subtle ways for us to just say, hey, you know, this area of my life, God, I really don't want your kingship. <laughs> or I'm, you know, I went, I went off to college and I, um, I, uh, I had been like the youth group president in my church. Although I will say, sadly, there really wasn't a lot of relationship that I understood about God. Um, and it definitely wasn't encouraged in my church. And that's a sad story. Um, it's part of what God used to sort of ignite me to help young people specifically know a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, but anyway, I was, I was like doing the thing. Like why we went to worship every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., 8 a.m., 8 a.m. Mom, what were you thinking? Uh, we went, we sat in worship every Sunday, and I know that God used his word um, and that time of worship to, to get something in my heart. But I will say that coming out of high school, I was like, I'm ready to do something else. I am not interested in being a part of the campus ministry at um, the college that I went to. I was not interested. Like, I've done that, been there, done that. I want to see what else is going on in the world. Okay, um, I didn't want to be that person anymore. I didn't want to be perceived as being that person anymore. And um, God, by his goodness, woke me up in a pretty significant way. Um, and I'm so thankful because I had no idea what I was missing. Because when it came to worship, to me, it was more of a, um, a regular thing we did, not a relationship, not a response to his goodness. And so he woke me up by bringing into my life people who knew Jesus, who were my age, which really I hadn't had a lot of that opportunity. Like I was like, what? What's going on? You know, because for me, it was more of adults did that and I got to kind of tag along um, by and large. And, uh, and so to be able to like see my friends, my peers, new friends, who loved Jesus. I remember um, going into the dorm room of one of my friends and, um, and they had a DC Talk poster up on the wall. And if you, <laughs> that might date me a little bit. Toby Mac was part of DC Talk. Anyway, uh, DC Talk poster. And I was like, whoa, I think that's like a Christian band. I remember thinking, I'm like, that's really bold that they would put a Christian poster on their wall. Like, whoa, you know? And um, through relationships with these people, I was ignited for God. And that's what I want to pray. I pray that for this community of Oasis Church. Like that the name Oasis is truly what happens here. Where people grow. Like where they celebrate. Like have you seen a palm tree lately? Especially as Iowans, we're like, oh, it praises God, okay? Things grow when we come together. And that's what I hope happens here in a way that's like life-giving. And um, that's, I am so thankful that that's been a huge part of my story, is being connected with other Christians who like love to talk to God, love to talk about God, love to talk about the things of God, um, love to have tons and tons of fun. Okay, random, crazy fun. I could tell you stories for days. That's the kind of people that we're invited to be, okay? And that's what we get to experience in community because that's what we've been designed to do is to celebrate God. If we are missing, though, what God is doing, we will be missing out on an opportunity to celebrate him because the party, and I, I kind of went away from our story in Luke 15 a second, there's a party at the end of this story, just like the other two stories. When the son who goes away says, forget you, dad, goes and he squanders, Jesus says, squanders all of the resources that his dad, hard-earned resources his dad had made. He comes back because he's starving. He's so hungry. He's malnourished. He needs what the father has. He's reached the end of his rope, and he says, I got to come back. I have woken up to my sin. At least I know the servants in my dad's house have more than enough to eat. I'm going back. And as he goes back, we, I hope, you know, I gave you this challenge last week to retell the story to some other person. And I don't know if you all, t I won't, you know, ask for a hand, hands raised, but if you haven't done it yet, or even if you did, do it again. Tell this story so it like takes root in your heart because there's so much here. The son runs back or walks back, I suppose, probably even crawls back if he's that hungry. And he comes back to the father. He's got this speech rehearsed of what he's going to say that, so that, dad, maybe you might hire me as a servant so at least I can have some food in my stomach. I'm, I'm in pain. 
And the dad sees him from a long way off, and he starts running the dad again. Remember in this honor culture, super, I mean, like, grown men didn't do that. He takes off running to his son. And uh, this, this week, as I was reading this again, another part of this story stuck out to me. He gets to his son, and, his, and the son starts rehearsing, starts saying what he's rehearsed. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy. To, you know, was he ever worthy? By the way, I'm not worthy to be called a daughter of the king of kings. I haven't earned that. Honestly, there's nothing we can do. He is perfect. We are not. <laughs> we don't have to earn it, okay? I am not worthy. And the, and the son, you can almost be like, yep, that's true. Because you're mine. You haven't earned it. It's the father who's extended the relationship. But the father said to his servants, verse 22, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. It doesn't say give it to him so he can put it on. It says put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. It's not his to put on himself. The righteousness of God is a gift. It's a gift from God. It's intended to be put on us. Not because we're worthy to be called his son or daughter, but because of his graciousness. You're coming back to me, kid. I love you. Let me return you into full relationship. And then the party begins. My friends, we're invited to celebrate God. The celebration is, um, is about God. When we worship, when we sing together, it's about God. Okay? It's about celebrating him. But if we miss what he's doing, we're going to miss out on opportunities to celebrate. So I want you to think, what's something God's done in your life in the last week? What, what's something you've seen, noticed? Maybe you haven't noticed it. Maybe we've just kind of run right by it. Like we've got blinders on our eyes. We're so busy here, right? And we've missed it. But let's think for a second. What's something that God has done in your life in the last week? If you can't think of anything, maybe think last month or six months. What's something? It can be small where he's shown up and shown off. He's shown you that he's attentive to you. He pays attention to you. I'm going to name David. David, you are one story for Oasis Church and the Durr family in bringing you to be connected in Oasis Church. You know, David has a heart for worship, and he loves to lead worship, and he's very humble in, in his doing it. But wow, what a gift it was to have you lead us in worship last week. And David's going to continue to do that twice a month. How cool is that? Like, we didn't work for that. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't twist David's arm. In fact, I, I made him bring it up first because <laughs> I know he's a gifted worship leader, but when they started coming to worship, I was like, of course, I was like, oh, it'd be so cool if we could have David lead us in worship. And then one day he's like, we should talk sometime about, you know, worship. I'm like, yes, we should. <laughs> let's, let's do that. I celebrate that. I could go around this room and online and give you story after story of the things that I celebrate that God is doing in Oasis Church. Some things I'm like not totally sure how it's all going to go, but I know God. And so I'm celebrating him even ahead of time. Like we can celebrate his provision even ahead of time. You know, we have a need for a new space to meet in at the end of September. We are likely not going to continue here at the Hilton Garden Inn. We'll be here through then, so those of you online, don't worry. Just keep coming. Come here to the Hilton Garden Inn. But we have a need for that, and we have seen God again and again in two locations that we've been in show up, provide. That's his character. So I don't want us to miss his character because that's when we worship, when we sing songs, that's what we're doing. We're just saying, God, you are great. But if we haven't stopped and acknowledged his greatness, if we haven't stopped and acknowledged what he's doing, um, and sometimes we need each other to help each other recognize that in our lives. If we haven't done that, we're going to miss an opportunity to celebrate. And we need to take every opportunity we can to celebrate. Because life isn't easy, right? It's really hard. In fact, this morning, I'm like, ah, um, you know, did you hear about this horrific tragedy in the Makoka Caves? What the heck? You know, um, three family members from Cedar Falls killed, like, of course, senselessly. 
and, an, and their son, I think he's nine, if I remember right, survived. Like, Lord, why? That's like not far from here. Like, if you haven't been on the Coconut Caves, it's an awesome place to go as a family, to, to have fun, to get away. I don't get it. And so I'm not suggesting to you that we just, like, act happy, like everything's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. But when we, when we look on God, who is so different than something like that, right, we recognize that we need him, that our world needs him. In view of a tragedy like that, we need and the world needs Jesus. Why? He's faithful. He is good. He is kind. He loves you. He is forgiving and merciful. He is honorable. He is true to his word. He is perfect. He does not fail. He won't give up. He doesn't get tired, you know, like we do. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He deserves our praise. He doesn't demand it, but when he clothes us with the things that we need, our opportunity to respond is to say, thank you, and you are awesome, and how did I try to do this without you, God? And we celebrate. The people gather after the sun comes home, and they dance and they sing. They dance and they sing. We're designed to celebrate and celebrate in community. So that's why we gather that's why we have Oasis Church, because we need to come together. We need each other. Thank you so much for that, Christine. We need each other, and we need to challenge and encourage one another, and we need to draw each other closer to the heart of God and remind each other of his goodness, especially when things are hard. We need that. I need that, and that's what God's called us to do and to be. And he calls us to do that in community. It wasn't a one-person party. In fact, the son, the older son, hears the singing and the dancing. I don't quite understand how he under hears the dancing, but anyway, maybe there's clapping. I don't know. Uh, he hears the singing and he hears the dancing from far away, and he comes and he's like, what's that about? You know, there are people who want to be curious about Oasis. They are curious about Oasis Church. They're curious about your life, in your workplace, in your family. Um, if you are celebrating God... People are going to be curious about why you're, like, you're that. And I'm not talking about, like, praise the Lord every time you walk down the hallway at school or in your workplace, okay? But it will be lived out in your life. People will see evidence of the joy that you have. Just like that older son. What's, what's, what's the singing and the dancing for? And we can, when having the opportunity, we can, reflect, we can tell people about who our good God is. That's not dependent on me being good enough. But actually the flip, he is so good in view of us and our failures and our sin. He is gracious. He is gracious, and we celebrate that. And we want to celebrate that individually. If you haven't caught on to the goodness of God or you feel like there's more to experience than there is, I want you to have some time with God. I want you to set aside a little bit of time in your life. Morning is often a good time for that. Before the craziness of the day, to set aside, it could be five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. Set some time aside to look on who God is, to like think about, oh, that's right, that's who you are. Go to God's word. Psalms is a really great place to go there. There's all kinds of really cool prayers that you can just like join in. Like your majesty is phenomenal, God. I mean, that's not a direct quote of a verse, okay? But there's lots of verses that talk about God's majesty, his creation, his goodness, all of that. For you to spend some time and let God remind you individually in view of what's going on in your life that he is all of those things that I was listing before. To go to his word and to read it and say, okay, Lord, oh, I don't know what that means, and keep going and reflect on his goodness and thank him for it, okay? Do that individually, and then we continue to do that together, and that's where growth happens, my friend. That's where celebration breaks out. That's where singing and dancing become things that we're used to. Because we don't want to miss the goodness of God and then miss opportunities to celebrate. 
we want to take note of the goodness of God and celebrate him. So uh, with that, we're going to um, experience Holy Communion. You know, Jesus gathered with his friends, and they were celebrating a meal. They were having a meal. By the way, if anybody's interested in going to Cheddar's after worship today, we're going to go there. Online people, come and join us, okay? So they gathered together, and, um, and they were having a meal together. And uh, Jesus takes the bread uh, at the meal. Bread was a big deal. Anybody like bread here? How about Texas Roadhouse bread? Okay, sorry, I digress. Jesus takes the bread, and he breaks it apart, and he gives it to them, and he says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this to reconnect with me, okay? And then he takes the cup, and we use grape juice here at Oasis Church um, right now anyway. He takes the cup, and he gives thanks again. He did that with the bread too. He gives thanks um, to God. Good note, right? He's doing that a lot. He gives thanks to God and he gives it to them. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. It's a new promise expressed in a new way in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And so we are going to gather here in a moment around this bread and cup, actually around Jesus, around the table that he invites us to, to celebrate him to be a part of the party, the singing and the dancing. Why? Because he is good. Because he is good. Mm -hmm.